Lord, we love you, Lord. We, we are always grateful to gather in your house, Lord God. We, uh, Lord, we need you. We thank you, Lord, that despite uh, the ups and downs of life, Lord God, despite the, the difficulties um, that we all experience, that none of us are immune from, uh, Lord, we thank you that we have you. And Lord, we've been learning so much specifically, Lord, from the book of Habakkuk about uh, the struggles that we all face and, and the questions that, that we all have. But Lord, we thank you so much that we have lessons that we can learn from your word. And I pray, Lord, for anyone, especially tonight, maybe, maybe going through something difficult, uh, maybe no one knows, but only you, Lord. I pray, Lord God, through your word, by your spirit, you would speak to them and you would bring comfort and assurance in their hearts, Lord God. We just, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to study your word. Uh, meet with us now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, good to see you tonight. Again, if you're not already there, Habakkuk chapter 3, okay? Habakkuk chapter 3, only three chapters in the book, and so we just started this a few short weeks ago, and tonight, again, we are going to wrap it up. Habakkuk chapter 3, if you're looking for it, remember, the Old Testament ends with 12 minor prophets. This is number 8, okay? Number 8 of the last 12 books of the Old Testament. Now, let me give you a quick recap of what we covered in the first two chapters. Again, very, very important. If you missed it, it's online, but let me just give you a quick recap. Habakkuk was a prophet that God raised up. And one of the interesting things about Habakkuk is he lived, again, uh, during the reigns of a few different kings, and, and he witnessed a spiritual revival take place during the time of King Josiah. He was the last good or godly king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Sadly, after his death, he died in battle. Uh, one of his wicked sons ends up taking the throne, and he literally leads the, the nation of Judah in the opposite direction. Kicks God out of the land so that the nation plunges into a spiritual decline, we would say. It's bad. And it was ugly. And so Habakkuk, as God raised up, again, it's believed he was a, a priest prior to being a prophet. And so he witnessed God moving. He witnessed, we would say, a spiritual revival take place in the nation. But then he also saw the complete reversal. He saw literally a complete collapse in the people of God as, as the nation as a whole walked away from the Lord. And so having witnessed all of this, he was filled with questions as he looked out every day and saw the state of the world, saw the condition of the people, and he began to do what many of us do today when we experience these similar things. We began to question, God, where are you at, right? God, don't you see what's taking place? Why are you allowing the wicked to prosper? When are you going to do something about it? We have these same questions, and so we can relate because this is exactly what Habakkuk felt. And I thank the Lord that he was so honest and real with God. How many of you know we need to be honest and real with God? Of course, respectful. He is our Father. He is our God. But we need to be honest. He knows our heart anyways. And so Habakkuk began to question, have genuine questions about what was happening and why it seemed that God was not doing anything. And that's the whole theme of the book. It's all about questioning God. And I love the fact that, again, he took the time to cry out to God, to literally go to God on behalf of the people, taking his issues before the Lord. And we saw this in the very beginning in, in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. He said, oh Lord, how long, right? How long shall I cry for help and you not hear or cry to you violence? Seen what was happening in the land, and you not save. Why do you make me see this sin, this wickedness, this iniquity? And why do you idly look at wrong? Why, why, why? Was his questions. Now, as I mentioned, God doesn't owe us an explanation. But thank God that in his goodness, thank God, even though he doesn't have to, I believe in his mercy, in his grace, he saw Habakkuk's persistence and so God responded and what did God say well remember verse 5 God told him look right open your eyes look among the nations and see wonder and be astonished for I God says am doing a work right God says I'm at work don't worry right I'm at work in your days that you would not believe if 
told, okay? Even if someone told you, God responded, I am working, okay? Don't ever doubt. Don't ever, you know, just because you might not see it, don't ever, you know, question for one second that I don't see what's going on, that I'm not up to something, that I'm not working behind the scenes because God says I am. Habakkuk, your problem is you're so focused on yourself, you're so focused on on what you're looking at, at your situation, that you're failing to look out and see what I'm doing because God's working everywhere, isn't he? And God was. And God told them, basically, open your eyes because I'm doing something. Look out among the nations. Look out among the world and see that I'm at work. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm doing something that you wouldn't believe it if I told you, okay? You wouldn't even believe the work that I am doing. And so what happened? God continued, right? Verse 6, God says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. God says, I'm doing it. Now you have to understand the Chaldeans, known to us as the Babylonians, were a wicked people, a violent people, a ruthless people. They were, we would say, worse sinners than the people of God, than the backslidden Israelites. And God said, I'm exalting them. I'm lifting them up. That bitter and hasty nation, even God said, called them out like that. Who marched through the breath of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Understand that during this time, the Babylonian empire was growing in power and they were like, Pac-Man, we would say. They were just gobbling up smaller nations left and right as they eventually would become the new world power. And God was doing that. God was allowing this to take place. Why? Because God was going to use the Babylonians to punish his own people. The Bible says, right, the wages of sin is, is death. There would be consequences. And we have to understand Even to us, no one's getting away with anything, okay? Even if we're the people of God, praise the Lord, hopefully we are. But it doesn't mean that God's just going to turn a blind eye to our sin. We will reap the consequences, okay? It doesn't matter who we are. They were going to be punished. They were going to be dealt with. But when Habakkuk heard this, right, he did what we would do. He began to scratch his head and go, wait, 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 how? How are you going to use them? God, they're worse than your people. How are you going to use worse sinners to punish sinners that were not as bad? How are you doing that? And so what did he do, right? God responded, but instead of just being thanking God for even taking the time to respond, he now has a second question, right? He has a follow-up question. He says, verse 12, Are you not from everlasting God, haven't you been around from the beginning? Haven't you seen it all? Don't you know it all? Oh, Lord, my God, my Holy One. God, aren't you holy? What do you have to do with wicked sinners? Why would you raise them up? How would you use them for your benefit? Again, he's scratching his head. I don't get it, God. It just doesn't make sense. I don't understand how a holy God would use a wicked people. Questioning God. Question after question. Well, again, in God's goodness, God responded. What did he say? Chapter 2, verse 2. The Lord answered me. Write the vision. Write what I'm showing you. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, just wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, notice, the soul is puffed up. God saw pride. It is not upright within him. He's talking about Babylon. He's talking about the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. God saw it all. Here, Habakkuk was saying, I don't know, God. Maybe you don't know how bad the Babylonians are. I'm not sure how you could use those wicked people. And God says, I know very well. I know how prideful they are. I know what they're about. I know there's no righteousness within them. God says, don't worry. I know. 
And because God knew, remember, God went on to reveal through the rest of chapter 2 that God would deal with them as well. Remember what I said, no one's getting away with anything. God was going to deal with them. They were not going to get away with their sin. They were not going to get away with the things that they were doing, which is why the Lord told him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Very popular verse, one you need to have highlighted, underlined in your Bible. What did God say? Look, he said, instead of focusing on the unrighteous, do we have a problem sometimes focusing on the unrighteous, right? We see the unsaved celebrities and, and these different people, and we're like, God, why do you do, when are you going to deal with these people? When are you going to humble these arrogant people, right? And God says, stop focusing on the unrighteous. Don't worry about them. The righteous shall live by faith. The word faith is trust. He says, don't worry about them. Don't worry about what I'm doing. Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. That's what God is saying. He says, if, if you're my people, if you're those that are right with me, then you'll trust me. Then you will live by faith. And that's beautiful. Again, it was so beautiful as Habakkuk was corrected. And it, it is a lesson for all of us because the reality is we often are going to find ourselves in that same place with questions. We don't know why. Things are going to happen. Unfortunately, we live in a fallen world. We are all going to face tragedy. That's, that's, the, that's just the reality, right? Anyone who says, oh, you give your life to Jesus, your life becomes a bed of roses and cupcakes and unicorns, they're lying to you because we all will experience difficulty, Right? In this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said. It's just part of it, okay? Especially as a Christian, I think it's even more difficult because we have Satan, the world, and the flesh that we have to contend with. And so what do we do in these situations? What do we do when we don't know what God is doing? When we don't know why God is doing it? When we don't know how God is doing it? Or even when we trust our God, don't we? We need to trust our God. We need to understand that, you know what? This side of eternity, there are going to be so many things that we just will not have the answers for. And I wish I could tell you that, that if we are as persistent as Habakkuk, God will appear to us and always give us the answers. But that's not the reality. God expects the just to live by faith. Okay? That is what we are called to do. Now, if you were with us in the introduction, I shared with you what the name Habakkuk means, okay? Hopefully some of you have it written down on your notepads. The name Habakkuk has two meanings, and they're related. Meaning number one is one who wrestles. That's what it means, okay? The second meaning, which is related, is one who embraces and you almost can get that picture of a wrestler trying to embrace their opponent. Does that make sense? So that's what the name means. And what's so interesting about it is that Habakkuk lives up to his name. For the first two chapters, he has been wrestling with God, hasn't he? But now that he was reminded that he can trust his God, that God knows what he's doing, that God is on the throne, he can now embrace the will of God even when he doesn't understand it. Does that make sense? Tonight, as we pick up and wrap up the book, we will cover the prayer of Habakkuk, okay? Very beautiful chapter tonight. It's actually a song, okay? The prayer of Habakkuk. We're going to cover the 19 verses of chapter 3. We're going to continue Habakkuk's dialogue with God. And the first thing we'll look at is Habakkuk's petition for future mercy. Okay, write this down. It'll help you understand as we make our way through. Habakkuk's petition for future mercy. Let's pick it up here. Verse 1, chapter 3. A prayer of Habakkuk. The prophet, according to Shigionoth, okay? According to Shigionoth. Now notice, and I love it, that it is a prayer, okay? What we are about to read is a prayer. And what I love about this, I want you just to imagine the scene. Habakkuk has just spent time with the Lord in his presence. Would you agree with that? He has been dialoguing with God. 
And he has heard God speak to him. That's what has just taken place. Understand that the proper response for anyone who has spent time with God and heard him speak is to respond. Does that make sense? Is not the communication we are to have with our God? He speaks to us, we speak back to Him. And that's never-ending. And we should continue that process. That's how our relationship is maintained. And so understand, that's what just happened, right? He has just had a conversation with God. He has just heard from God. He has just spent time hearing from God. And now He responds in prayer. And it's beautiful, because that is something that we are all supposed to do. How many times have you heard me at the end of a message say, now that we've heard from God, it's time to spend time with Him in prayer. Right? We now respond after hearing from the Word of the Lord. Now it's beautiful. I mentioned that this is a song. And notice it says, according to Shigionoth. You guys see that? Well, that word is an interesting Hebrew word. Okay? It's a verb. And what it means, get this, To reel and fro. That's what it means. Okay? How many of you, when you're worshiping God, reel and fro? That's what it means. It's beautiful. Okay? That's what it means. Some of you are maybe stiff as a board and you need to loosen up a little bit. It's all right. Right? It's all right. But it means to reel and fro. And it describes that movement, right? Worshiping our God with passion and excitement. And I love it. And the idea here is that Habakkuk wrote this, but he wrote it in a poetic way that this prayer would then be sung during temple worship for the people to pray and praise their God. It's beautiful, okay? Understand, this is what it means. Keep going, verse 2. He says, O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. Oh, Lord, do I fear. Interesting. In the midst of the years, revive it. If you have a pen, underline revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now, one of the scriptures, again, I know we all know, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing what? The word of God. Okay? Let me ask you. Did Habakkuk just hear the word of God? God had just spoken to him, didn't he? And so, having heard the word of God, he was built up, we would say. Faith in his heart was was generated by God through his word. Now, the Lord had just revealed to him through his word, chapter 2 specifically, that God was going to judge the children of Israel, right? He was going to bring his judgment by the Babylonians upon the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. And so, Habakkuk has heard that from God. He receives it as the truth of God's word, and he accepts it. When God speaks, we should believe it, we should receive it, and we should accept it. Okay, That's what he does. That's exactly what he does. I'll put it this way. He comes to God and he goes, okay, God, I get it. I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me, but I get it. You have chosen to raise up the Babylonians. You're going to send them to bring judgment upon my people. Habakkuk included. Now, Habakkuk knew, right? Habakkuk knew that the people deserved it. He knew that. That was a fact. The people deserved it. And because he knew the people deserved it, notice what he said. He says, I fear. I fear. Okay? He was afraid. He was afraid specifically for them. Because he knew when God said it, it was going to happen. That God took their sin serious and they were about to be punished Which is why, what did God ask for in that last line? He says, in wrath, remember what? Mercy. No one's getting away with anything. Judgment was coming. And he accepted and he said, okay, God, I accept your will. Your will be done. I just pray, Lord God, that when your judgment falls, have mercy, Lord. Have mercy upon them. 
Okay? Have mercy upon them. But not only that, again, look back at what it says. He says, in the midst of the years, revive it. Interesting. Revive it. Now, he began by saying, Lord, I've heard about you. I've heard about your works. I've heard about what you've done. I've heard about what you can do. And I know you've saved your people in the past. I know you've judged your people in the past. Oh, Lord, when you judge us this time, have mercy. And Lord, revive us. That's what he says, revive us. Now that is so interesting because you have to understand what he's praying. He's praying that God would be lenient, right? Lenient upon his people, even though he knew they deserved judgment. And he says, God, in the midst of that judgment, bring us back to you. Bring a spiritual awakening in the hearts of of your people, Lord. Let that happen. And it's beautiful, the fact that he prays for revival. Now, what's really interesting about this, and again, I have to stop and just cause us to consider something. I believe, like Habakkuk, we're living in the last days. Remember, history says it was a couple years away when literally destruction fell. When the Babylonians invaded Judah and everything that went bad, we would say. And so what did Habakkuk do? Well, Habakkuk did his, his part in warning people to get right, right? That they may obtain mercy. But even when they did not listen, what did he do next? He prayed for mercy, right? Now think about this. How many of us, again, have peace in our heart (laughs) that the Lord's going to rapture us out of here and save us from the tribulation? But how many people do we know and love are going to be left behind? Not because we want them to, but because that's probably the reality. Now, again, we need to follow Habakkuk's example, right, and do everything we can in praying for them and in sharing with them so that they would repent and escape the judgment to come, just like Habakkuk was doing. You guys see the parallel? But how many of you have have ever thought this? Lord, for those that will be left behind, when you pour out your judgment, have mercy. You guys understand that? And revive them. Revive them, Lord. Draw them to you. Isn't there going to be a revival taking place during the tribulation? What a prayer, huh? Have we thought about that? Again, I want to see everyone I know and love make it out of here. Escape the coming judgment, no doubt. But you know what the reality is? Many of them won't. We need to pray for mercy. We need to pray for mercy again. We need to pray that God would get a hold of them, that God would save them in the midst of judgment breaking out during that seven-year tribulation. So interesting. But again, you can understand the parallel. That was Habakkuk's prayer. That's how it began. God, do something, right? God, do something. Not only extend your mercy, do what you did before. Bring your people back, right? Bring your people back. God, do it again, right? Do it again, God. What I know you can do, what you have done before, God, do it again. This is how Habakkuk began his prayer. But let's keep going. Second thing. After God's, or Habakkuk's petition for future mercy, next God's power in past memory. Okay, follow along. What did he pray about next? Well, What Habakkuk does is brilliant, and I love it. Habakkuk encourages himself. He encourages himself. God had stirred his heart with faith to accept and believe that God's will was going to be done. And so now, again, he is encouraging himself that God would give him hope. That God would do everything that he said he would do. That he would keep his promises. And I love this because this is what he begins to do. He begins to take the time to remind himself, and this is Habakkuk speaking. He begins to remind himself of the awesome things that God has done in the past. He begins to meditate on those things. 
Because when we meditate how awesome our God is and all that he's done in the past, once again, it strengthens our faith even more, right? That he's that same God. That what he did in the past, again, he can do again. And it fills us with assurance. It fills us with confidence that the God who fulfilled his will in the past is the same God that will fulfill his will in the future. And so he begins to meditate on what God has done. Look at verse 3 and 4. God came from Teman, and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah, okay, or Selah. His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Now what is Teman? Well, Teman refers to the land of Edom, of the Edomites. It's an area located south of Judah and east of the Dead Sea, okay? It's where Esau and his descendants from Edom resided. This was their home. We would call it today the southern portion of the country of Jordan. Also, he mentions Mount Paran. Mount Paran is another name for the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, So we're talking about Egypt up into Jordan. Now, what is special about that location, right? What is special about that place? What did God do in that area? And he is reflecting back on the deliverance that God brought to the children of Israel after they were in captivity for 430 years. God delivered them, didn't he? And he rescued them. He delivered them from Egypt. He brought them to Mount Sinai. He ministered to his people. He made them his people. He entered into a covenant with them. He gave them his law. And then he led them by his Shekinah glory, didn't he? All the way to the promised land. God did that. His people were slaves in Egypt, as they would soon be slaves in Babylon. But God rescued them. God delivered them. God stirred them up under Moses and led them, right, into a covenant relationship with with God. And this is what Habakkuk desires. God, do it again. Do that same thing. And I love this because, again, he mentions that word, selah. Selah is another musical notation. And the word is often used to instruct this, those singing to pause. We would say pause. That's what the word refers to. Why are we to pause? Well, it's the idea that we're singing and we're to stop and reflect on what we have sung as we bring glory and exaltation to the Lord. And that's exactly what this says. He has taken the time again to praise God, to pray to God, reminding himself of all that God had done for his people. And then he stops just to reflect on it. Wow, Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you did that, Lord. And again, as he reminded himself what God did, it stirs him up too. It stirs him up. It, it strengthens. It you know, uh, in, you know, instills confidence, right? More so in God. Keep reading Before him, before God went pestilence and plague followed at his heels. Is God powerful? How about the ten plagues on Egypt? God did that, right? If you remember, the interesting thing about the the plagues upon Egypt is every one of those ten plagues was addressed towards one of the false gods the Egyptians worshipped. God was demonstrating his power. He was demonstrating that he is the only true God and that there was nothing Pharaoh or his army or their false gods could do again to stop him. And again, Habakkuk brings this up as another reason to worship God, as another reason that he could believe that God could do it again. Verse 6, he stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. From the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. 
What a sight it must have been when God came down and met with his people on Mount Sinai. When the mountain shook, right? The people of God were so afraid even to approach the mountain, remember? They said, Moses, you go. Fire and smoke and clouds and lightning and thunder. God was there. This is the true God, the only true God. Verse 7, I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Now there are several instances in Exodus 15, Deuteronomy 2, and Joshua 2, and Joshua 5 that record that the neighboring nations, and here are two are mentioned, those in Kushan and those in Midian, those neighboring nations began to hear about the God of Israel. And they began to be afraid. And then they began to hear that the people were leaving Mount Sinai and they were heading north, weren't they? And they began to be afraid. Afraid of the Israelite people because they were afraid of their God. He causes the nations again to tremble. Verse 8. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation? Interesting. He's asking questions here. You've got, got a couple questions here that Habakkuk asks the Lord. What did God do to the rivers? Well, the Jordan River, for example, he caused it to dry up, didn't he? How about the Red Sea? What did he do to the Red Sea? He parted it. He parted it, right? God demonstrated his awesome power over nature. And then the interesting thing, right, is that after his people passed through the Red Sea, God brought the, the sea to come back, destroying the army of Pharaoh with their horses and their chariots, right? God did all that. Demonstrating his power over nature. Now, if anyone witnessed those acts of nature, see what God did to the river, see what God did to the Red Sea, they might think to themselves, God, were you mad at the river? Does that make sense? God, were you mad at the sea? Were you, were you just angry? Were you punishing you know, the river? Were you punishing the sea? What's the answer? No. No. God wasn't punishing nature. He was simply using nature to demonstrate his awesome power. Now, what I think is so interesting on that, how many of you have ever thought to wonder when we see incredible floods or earthquakes or hurricanes, right? Those are nothing compared to our God. And sometimes we wonder and we question why God would allow these incredible things, avalanches, I mean, we, the list can go on, why God allowed these things to take place? Because they demonstrate His power. Because they demonstrate again, He is greater than that. That that's nothing compared to Him. And if you're like me specifically, you know, I'm, I don't live in Florida, but, you know, whenever hurricanes, you know, are on the map, you see this giant, right, go over the states. You guys with me? And they look so massive, but they're nothing compared to God. He is greater than those things. And again, I believe God allows these events. What do we call them? What do, what do the insurance companies call them? Acts of God to demonstrate how awesome our God is. Verse 9. You strip the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows. Selah. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their place. At the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from their thigh to neck. Selah. 
You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. Again, he recites event after event, okay? Some of the earlier verses covered from God's deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt, right? To Sinai. Now he recounts from Sinai all the way into the promised land, into the land of Canaan, right? First through Moses and then through Joshua, right? He cites in the book of Joshua, when God caused the moon and the sun to stand still, God did that. As God gave them favor, it was as if God was marching before them when they conquered the people of Jericho. And city after city and Canaanite uh, nation after nation, right? God went before them, threshing them, wiping them out, judging them for their sin, and handing over the promised land to his people. Why was all this brought up? Again, because as he reflected on it, as he thought about it, as he reminded himself of the credible things that God had done in the past, it only strengthened his faith. It only reinforced the trust that he had in God that what God did in the past, again, he will do in the future. And I love this because, again, this is the example that Habakkuk sets for us. We are going to go through trials. We are going to go through difficulties. We are going to face circumstances that make us afraid, that even cause us to fear. And so what should we do when we find ourselves in those predicaments? We are to do the same exact thing that Habakkuk did. Number one, we are to remind ourselves how awesome and mighty our God is. Because the bigger our God is, the smaller our problems become. Isn't that right? And so we have to, we need to remind ourselves, number one, who our God is, and number two, what our God has done. Let me ask you, has God done things for you in your life? And when you are faced with that new challenge, that next trial, you need to reflect on how awesome, how big your God is, and then remind yourself of what He did for you in the past. Because it encourages you again that He will do it again. That is the perfect antidote, right, for a troubled heart. Spending time with God, reminding yourself who He is and what He has done so that, again, you will have confidence that He will do it again. One of the biggest problems that that we have, and I say we, being myself included, is we're so focused on our circumstances, aren't we? We look around us, and the more we look around, the more we walk by sight, the more discouraged we become. And so how about instead of looking around, we look up. That's what we need to do. That's exactly what Habakkuk did. And as he began to stop looking around and focus up on God, on the Lord, his circumstances didn't change, but he did. Let me say it again. As he stopped walking by sight, he started walking by faith, he stopped looking around, but instead only looked up. Even though his circumstances didn't change, he did. Because the faith inside changed him. And we get to read about this change next. Last thing tonight. We read about Habakkuk's petition, his prayer for future mercy. He reminded himself of God's power in past memory. And now, how about Habakkuk's peace in the meantime? Okay? Talking about the present. Habakkuk's peace in the meantime. Look at verse 16. He says, I hear, and my body trembles. He heard what was going to happen. He heard the Babylonians were coming, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. How many of us feel that way sometimes, right? We hear bad news. We go through difficulty. We experience trial. 
We hear about what's going on. We, hear, we watch the news and we hear that it, it's only getting worse. And we start to feel weak. We start to feel broken. We can so easily feel hopeless and fall into despair. And that's how he felt, again, knowing that things were only about to get worse for his people. But look what he says. See that next word? Yet. Yet. Yet, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. I'm going to stop complaining to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. I'll put it this way. Though I have no money in the bank account, my car tank is on empty, right? There's no food in the cupboard. You hear what he's saying? I get sick. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Look what he says. Verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. He, he declared it right there. He declared it. Lord, no matter how bad things become, I'm not going to complain anymore. I'm not. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to stop asking questions, and I'm just going to allow you to be God. I'm going to trust that you know what you are doing, which is why despite what takes place, what does he say? I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. Now that is powerful, right? That is powerful. But what's interesting, again, this is the same thing that we as Christians are commanded to do today. Did you guys know that? The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, he says this. You guys know these verses. He says, rejoice when? Always. Always. Good times? Bad times? All times? Always. He says, pray without ceasing. Always be in prayer. Pray about everything. In everything, give thanks. That's interesting. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God In Christ Jesus for you. This is what God desires for you. Okay? Very important. Very beautiful, incredible passage. But I want to highlight something for you which is interesting. He tells us to rejoice always. Good times and bad times. You might be thinking, how do I do that? How am I supposed to rejoice in the bad times? He also says, in everything, give thanks. In everything. Give thanks. Now, how many of you can do that? How many of you can be thankful in everything? Now, notice that he says, give thanks in everything. He doesn't say give thanks for everything. Because we won't give thanks for trials, right? We won't give thanks when we get sick or get laid off or or difficult things happen. Those are too difficult for us to do. But what we can do, not for everything, but in everything, we can just thank God. We can thank God knowing that God is able to work all things out for our good. Thank you, Lord. I don't understand it. I might not be happy about it, right? But I can thank you for it. Because I know somehow, some way, even though it makes zero sense to me, I trust you. I know you're good. I know you have my back. I know you take care of your kids. And I know you're going to work it out some way for my good. That's what the scriptures promise, don't they? And it's for that reason that we're supposed to rejoice. Always. Rejoice, right? Always. No matter what takes place. No matter how bad things might seem, no matter what we see or or how we feel, we need to rejoice, trusting in our God by faith, 
as we remind ourselves through hell or high water that our God is on the throne, isn't he? He's on the throne, okay? Not only is he on the throne, but he knows what he is doing. Now, always remember, we're not commanded to be happy all the time. We're not. We're not always going to be happy. That's okay. Why? Because happiness comes from happenings, right? Things are happening good around you, you're happy. Things are happening bad around you, you're not happy. Always remember, happiness is based upon happenings. We turn on a, a happy, upbeat song and we feel good, right? We turn on a sad song and we could feel down. Those are our emotions. They're like a roller coaster, right? They go up and down. The source of happiness is happenings. In contrast, the source of joy is who? Is God. Does he ever change? No roller coaster in him, right? He is the same. Our joy comes from God. He is the source of our joy, which is why when we have him, when we are in that intimate relationship with him, when we truly are his children, we can have joy in him because he doesn't change, because we know he keeps his word. No matter what, we can trust in him because we know our God doesn't change, which is why we can rejoice. Now let's look at the last verse. Last verse, verse 19. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. Now what's so beautiful about verse 19 is Habakkuk's attitude. How many of you know that attitude is a big deal? His attitude. God, the Lord, my strength. What a contrast from his opening complaining words in chapter 1, right? In chapter 1, we would say he was down in the dumps. He was feeling despair. He was confused. He had questions. Why? Because he was not walking by faith. He was walking by sight. But what happened? Did his circumstances change? No. His circumstances didn't change. He changed. He began to walk by faith. He began to trust in the Lord. And all this happened again as he received and believed and accepted God's word and began to take the time to meditate on who his God is and how awesome his God is and all that his God is able to do. And as his faith grew, as he did these things, right, it's almost as if he left the valley of despair and now he was walking on a mountaintop. You guys get the picture? That's what he says. Look back what he says. He says, he makes my feet like the deer's. How many of you watch National Geographic, right? And you see these deers with these little skinny legs, right? And yet they're walking on top of mountains and high cliffs. And you're like, how did they do that? How do they do that without falling? Habakkuk says, that's what God is able to do for you. He's able to take you to victory. He is able to take you to the top of the mountain by faith as you trust in your God. And remember, two last verses. 1 John 5, 4. John the Apostle says this. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What's the victory? It's our faith. Our faith in God is what enables us to overcome the world. Is that a lesson for us? Yes. It is a lesson for us. We have to do, we should do, what Habakkuk did. Remind yourself of what God did in the past, which will encourage us that God will do it again in the future. And when we know that, we will have peace today in the present, right? We will have peace today in the present, which is why the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 said, Do not be anxious. Don't worry. Don't stress about anything. 
But in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. When we walk in faith, we walk in victory. Amen? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the book of Habakkuk. All right? Amen. Amen. This cla- I want to clap. Yay! I want to clap. I'm excited. I'm excited. We've been, not- we've been going through some books lately. And so, amen. I'm excited. Well, amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, as always, for your goodness. Lord, we thank you, Lord. I, I get excited, Lord God. I love studying your word and-, and the privilege of being able to share it. And I pray, Lord, we are learning, Lord. We are growing. And tonight, Lord God, that our faith is increasing, Lord God. As we learn from Habakkuk, as we learn from your word, are we reminded of these awesome lessons that despite, Lord God, even hearing of bad news, even hearing that things might get worse in this world, we don't have to stress. We don't even have to worry, Lord. We can trust that our God is in charge. We can trust that our God is on the throne. He knows what he's doing. He's taken care of us in the past, right? He has plans for us in the future. And for that reason, we can have peace in the meantime. Thank you, Lord, for all these things. We love you, Lord, and we thank you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand, guys.